look up skepticism and nihilism, not just in the dictionary, but in a philosophical reference. There's a whole philosophical tradition behind both of these terms, and you should be familiar with it for this discussion because we're going to reference uh, some of the typical arguments of skepticism and nihilism. Skepticism and nihilism, one of their primary arguments is doubting the reality of the world. Descartes begins from even doubting his own existence. And for a phenomenologist, this is a non-issue. Uh, obviously we exist. Obviously the world exists. So the extreme claims of skepticism and nihilism are pretty much useless. But skepticism toward the claims of the world is a very good idea because most of them are just idle talk, not based on any actual evidence. And they certainly don't inquire into the being of the thing that they're talking about. So uh, they're pretty much useless for our purposes. From a phenomenological point of view, the only reality that matters is our experience. If we can't experience it, then it's not real. Now the problem is, there's more than just experience. There's also attitude and the way you hold things and the philosophical context and so on. Now in ordinary being, the world is the context that gives the meaning. In other words, when one is being in the world, the world itself determines the meaning of who we are, what we are, what we're capable of, what our possibilities are, and so on. But skepticism toward the world as a thing in itself is unprovable. Certainly we can be skeptical toward the things in the world, the people in the world, the claims of the world, yes. But the world itself does not show up as an object in our experience. It's like the water for the fish. We never see anything outside the world, only within the world. The world itself is the context. So skepticism's main argument is unprovable, therefore it's not refutable either. So the power of skepticism is derived from the fact that you can doubt anything. All you have to say is, I don't believe it, and nobody can convince you. Uh, you just hold your ground, and that's about the end of the argument there. But of course, skepticism is logically self-defeating because you can also doubt the skeptic and doubt skepticism itself. So it becomes a logical conundrum. However, the skeptical attitude of I don't believe it does find sufficient evidence in the world to nourish itself. So. You can analyze so many claims in the world, uh, question them for their basis of evidence, find out that they're false, and say, see, aha, it was wrong, I was right. So uh, the skeptic finds plenty of evidence in the world to bolster his claim that actually this is not true. And we'll see how that actually uh, comes in very useful for our ontological investigations. We welcome skeptical questions of our views. For example, the typical skeptical comment of, uh, well, this isn't true. What you're saying isn't true. And we say, that's right. It's not true. Because anything we can say is just words, and truth doesn't fit in words. Words aren't big enough. They're just symbols. They're not the truth. The map is not the territory. We're talking about your being. And if you are going to see whether what we're saying is true or not, you have to look into your being and verify what we're saying by your experience. The triple structure of skepticism is anxiety is the subject, claims are the object, and doubt is the relation. Or you can diagram this out. 
it'll help you understand skepticism. Skepticism reveals us as beings with a possibility for self-reflection because of the point I made first here that uh, the things we're talking about are not expressible in words and we admit that from the very beginning. We're talking about being and almost nobody understands what we're talking about when we say that because being is a neglected subject in our culture. But if you look into your being you will find the things that we're speaking about. So actually you can verify the points that we're making through a skeptical attitude and that's the beginning of our real work. Look up uncanniness. It's a very interesting word. It really expresses the feeling of being in the world. We feel that we're not at home in the world because we can't choose the situations and the possibilities that we're thrown into. That means we don't have any power. We've given up our power to external structures, authority structures and value structures of the world. So we feel anxiety, but we usually project our anxiety on some object and we made the point last time that the news, for example, is full of objects just ready for us to project our anxiety on. Uh, this is a subject in art, The Scream by Eduard Munch, uh, and there's a Norwegian poem that goes along with it, and they express this mood of objectless anxiety. And this is a very good feeling we should open ourselves to this feeling because it reveals the fact that we're not at home in this world even though our being is very worldly and this is a paradox for us uh, cognitive dissonance for us and if we look into this it reveals a very interesting point which we discuss in the next slide When we use the word disconnect here, we mean an alienation, uh, a distance, a void. Uh, we feel a void between ourselves and the world and between ourselves and other people. And this void or emptiness discloses that we are a space. We're not a thing. We're a process. We're a space where stuff shows up and the whole world shows up in our space. Now the interesting point about anxiety that I mentioned in the previous slide is that it causes us to doubt the other. I've been going along with the program here, following all the value systems of the other, being in the world with all my energy and attention, and but I'm anxiety. I'm in anxiety. Why should I feel anxiety? Maybe the claims of the other are not really authentic. Huh? Maybe somebody is leading me astray here. Maybe the world itself is false. And you see how this leads to the big doubts of the skeptic that maybe the world itself isn't real. Maybe it doesn't really exist. But that's going too far. It's going far enough to say maybe the world is not really my home. Maybe the world is not really, uh, does not really have my best interests at heart. And it leads us to question common sense, what everybody knows, the typical understandings and claims of the world. And that's very good because it leads us towards our true self. Look up falsification. Falsification is a philosophical and scientific term, and so is contingency, at least in philosophy. Look these up in a good philosophical source. The skeptic does us a great service by falsifying the ordinary truths of being in the world, because they are lies. They are not our real being. So being in the world is never going to lead us to become all that we can be. The army's recruiting slogans notwithstanding. So by revealing 
and falsifying the false claims of the world, the skeptic gets us to look at the possibility that maybe there's another way of being. Maybe there's some other way to approach being in the world that doesn't restrict our possibilities to those derived from external sources. And if that's the case, then we might become something more. And so this is a very wonderful idea. And uh, we can thank the skeptic for pointing us in that direction. The skeptic is like the finger pointing at the moon. Uh, the skeptic cannot give us our full, complete being. But he can point the way and say that we should reflect on this and consider this new possibility. Skepticism is a particular type of projected anxiety. It's anxiety projected on the entire world. In other words, the skeptic comes to doubt the entire world. Maybe it's just an accident. Maybe it's just contingent. Uh, maybe the way we turned out or the way we wound up being isn't the only way that we could be. Maybe there's another way that we could be that would be better. And so it is. But skepticism, when it goes too far, undermines its own logical foundation. In other words, unfettered doubt, doubt without limits, eventually eats itself up, uh, like the worm Ouroboros that eats its own tail until there's nothing left. But the skeptic, his contribution is valuable because he finds a reason not to care about the world. He finds a reason to detach us from the world. Uh, we're trying so hard to live up to the world's expectations and standards. But guess what? We can't because they're not real. So the skeptic actually wakes us up that actually we don't have to care about idle talk. Huh? It's irrelevant. It's just an uh, unproven assertion. And they get all passionate about this. And this passionate doubt of the world leads to a passionate rejection of the other. And that's good because it throws us back on ourselves. And it begins the process of authentic self-reflection that, oh, maybe I could be some other way. The skeptic wakes us up to the uncanniness of being in the world. Ordinarily, we internalize and identify with the worldliness of the world. In other words, we bring it into ourselves because the meaning that we assign to things and people has to be internal to ourselves. Meaning doesn't live outside of us. Our meaning lives inside. So when we internalize the world's meaning, we identify with its worldliness. However, the meaning of our life can never be external. It can't be imposed by the world. We have to internalize it through identification. And the problem is, we internalize the claims of the other without attempting to verify them by evidence or by self-reflection. So, uh, this uncritical acceptance of the claims of the world actually shows that meaning is a structure internal to ourself. And if that's true, then the meaning that's given by external sources cannot possibly be our meaning. Our meaning can only be derived from inside of ourselves. And the skeptic points this out. The skeptic points out that meaning is internal. Even if it's derived from the world, it's actually ours because we have taken claim of it. We have adopted it. We have accepted it as our own. And then it guides us from within. But skepticism goes too far in claiming that all meaning is derived or created by human beings and that ultimately the world is meaningless. No, it's not. The world is real and the world has meaning. 
It's just not the meaning that comes from within ourselves. So the value of the skeptical attitude is that it points out that ultimately meaning is an internal phenomenon. And that even if we accept meaning from external sources, we do so by making it our own. And that means that we don't have to do that. We have a choice about it. We can choose to reject external sources of meaning and derive our own meaning from internal self-reflection. And that is exactly the process of phenomenological investigation. Nihilism is a very extreme form of skepticism that says the world is utterly unreal. And of course, uh, uh, this is going way too far. The world is certainly real, and we are certainly real. Um, there is no truth in the extremes of uh, Buddhism, let's say, um, that say not only are we unreal, but we're changing from moment to moment. So the person who receives the results of our activities is not the person who performs them and so on. Uh, that's just ridiculous. Oneness, uh, which we often hear in the uh, Hindu context, is also a form of nihilism. Because if you have oneness, if, you, if everything is one, there's no consciousness, there's no existence, there's no activity, there's no beingness. Um, we have to have trinity, the subject, the object, and naturally their relation. Uh, before we can have existence or consciousness or activities or anything. So uh, the ontological truth is found in Trinity, the trinary ontological um, structure that underlies everything that's real. Now, the truth about nihilism is that no external source of meaning can mitigate our existential anxiety. That's the part that's true. The intellectual expression of that is the part that we question. But we have to recognize that even though the meanings of the other are false, they still affect us. We can't just wish them away because they do have an effect on us. If somebody tells a lie about us, it makes us feel outraged angry, hurt. So even though the statement is a lie, it still affects us. Similarly, the meanings of the other affect us, even if we know they're false. Nihilism goes on to say that because the world is false, we need some external structure of meaning, some external authority to determine what's real and what's false. The problem with this is that no external structure can be constituted in the same way as our being in the world. It would have to be otherworldly, transcendental. The external source of meaning also, uh, because it's outside of ourself, and whether it, that's being in the world or some transcendental source, could not completely engage our energy and attention because it would be alien. It would be structured on some different pattern than our own being. Therefore, the transcendental model offers a false alternative to worldly meaning by saying there's another world and it's constituted completely different from this one and that world actually gives the meaning of everything in this world. Well, that can't work. It can't work because it's not part of our internal ontological structure. It would have to be something external to us, alien to us. So how can it explain the meaning of our lives? And actually, all philosophical systems require some external source of meaning, uh, some unexamined assumptions, some a priori axiomatic truth. But... In our phenomenological investigation, we cannot find any external source of truth that matches the ontological structure of our being and of our being in the world specifically. 
So the transcendental theory is completely wrong. It's a false alternative. And we'll find the real alternative later on in our examination of death. Real meaning must be rooted in our experience. That's the only way that we get the full access to our complete being, energy, and attention. If we're going to be successful, and remember the context for all of this is a discussion of how to attain economic revival and success in a difficult time. For us to be successful, the meaning that we give must be rooted in our experience. That gives us access to all of our resources. So one of the points we want to make here is that nihilism and impersonalism are inherently identical. The impersonalism of the world, of being in the world, is a form of nihilism. It says that nothing is true, everything is permitted, and if you're, especially if you're a member of the ruling class, you can get away with any kind of lie and so on and so forth. Well, we don't accept that. We do need a transcendental source of meaning. We do need an a priori assumption or an axiomatic truth, a ground of being to give our life meaning. But it's not nihilism and it's not any transcendental world that's beyond our experience because that splits us inherently and we can never get access to our full energy. When we uh, get a little bit farther on in our analysis here, we'll discuss the uh, actual transcendental source of meaning in a phenomenological context. Skepticism goes too far in doubting everything. It becomes only a negative influence on us. It can't give us anything positive. All it can say is that this is wrong, that is wrong, that's a lie, this is an illusion, and so on. So the value of skepticism is that it can reveal the objectless nature of anxiety. If we disbelieve in everything, all the objects and assertions and claims of being in the world, then we can allow the world as a whole to show up in our space. And that will also delineate our true individuality by combining all the objects of our attention into one and focusing it on ourselves. The other value that skepticism provides in the phenomenological context is that it reveals what really matters. What are we truly anxious about? What are we really concerned about in life? And of course, the answer in our context is ourselves, our being. Our being is an issue for us. Of all the creatures in this world, only human beings can inquire into their being. If we don't inquire into our being, we are not being a human being in the full sense of the term. Therefore, we do not have access to our full capabilities, to our full energy, to our full attention and intelligence. And if we want to be a success in this world, we have to be everything that we can be. Skepticism is an important tool in phenomenological inquiry, but skepticism in and of itself goes too far. It undercuts itself. If the reality of the world is unknowable, if actual truth is unknowable, then how can we doubt it? We can only doubt something that we know. Uh, so if the reality itself is unknowable, then doubt is also invalid as a process. Skepticism thus conceals itself as a rational argument, but actually it's not. Actually, it's an attitude. And the skeptical attitude is a good way to falsify claims. But it is not an ontological system. It cannot replace 
true ontological analysis or phenomenological self-inquiry. Exercises and Questions Friend of the Heart is a private educational network. Being in the world is only preliminary background material. The real value and power we offer is in our private seminars, individual training, consulting, and coaching. This material is not easy, but our advanced courses are even more difficult. Without mastering being in the world, you can forget about our private courses. Our commitment is to share with you our powerful tools and systems for changing your being for ultimate success in life. To be invited to our private seminars, you must demonstrate your commitment and integrity by completing the questions and exercises of each section. Locate a source of anxiety. Is it really the source? Get clear that your anxiety is actually without an object and you are projecting your anxiety on that object. Diagram the triple structure of skepticism, anxiety, claims, and doubt, which is the subject, object, and relation. Get clear that you cannot experience the world in its totality, but only the objects in the world. Find something you are doubtful about and see how that doubt is a product of your anxiety. Now how does it look to you? Get in touch with your feeling of not being at home in the world. How does it feel? Get in touch with your feelings of space between yourself, other people, and the world. Be that space and see what shows up in it. Try not caring about something in the world that you think you are supposed to care about, but really don't. What opens up for you? Identify some external sources of meaning in your life. Are they part of some ism? Take courage and confront, look into, a source or object of strong anxiety for you. What happens?